Well, is God good or what? Amen. 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 What a privilege to be a Christian. If you ever get a chance to be one, grab it. Because it is the only way to live. So I, I've been doing it for, wow, I shouldn't tell you. Because then you'll think I'm old. But I guess next year it'll be 60 years I've been born again. So anyway, uh, what a life. But it's a lot better now than it was back when I began. Because I didn't really understand everything back then. And the longer I live for the Lord, the more I understand it, the more wonderful it becomes. And I'm just so happy. Well, it's wonderful to be back with you here in uh, New Life Church. And you've shifted pastors since I was here last. And you kicked Brother Stanley Sr. over to Bishop. And now then, Pastor Stanley is here. And what a privilege. I'm excited about the future of this church. Wow. There's no limit. I, I quit saying long ago, the sky's the limit. I think that's wrong. There is no limit. <laughs> Didn't the Lord say that he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we're able to ask or think? Now, that's scary because I can think pretty big. I've always been sort of a big thinker. But when you talk about God being able to do exceeding abundantly, uh, that's a marvelous thing. Well, great to see everybody here tonight. Uh, let's get started. First thing, there are envelopes all over. Would you pick one of those up right now? Get one of those in your hand and open up the inside. We have something free that we want to give to you. So if you'll put your name, your address, and your email address, End Time Ministries prepares a weekly prophecy e-newsletter. And we put in there the late-breaking events of that week that pertain to the fulfillment of Bible prophecy in one way or another. So if you'll fill out your name, address, and email address, please write as legibly as possible. My handwriting seems like the older I've gotten, the worse it's gotten. And all of a sudden, people started calling me do doctor, and I was trying to figure out why they were calling me doctor. And then it dawned on me they were looking at my handwriting, so they knew I had to be a doctor. Anyway, it was so bad. Uh, but please write as legibly as you can because we have to be able to get this to you. Uh, you'll receive it every week from now on. And it's absolutely free. You'll never be charged for it. You'll get it every week until the rapture. After the rapture, there won't be any more. Because we're not going to be here to produce it, and we certainly hope you're not here to receive it. Uh, anyway, up until that time, you'll, this will be your weekly wake-up call. Don't go to sleep at the wheel now. God is still moving in the earth, and we're marching straight toward the second coming of Jesus Christ. So fill it out right now, and we're going to collect those after a while. Do not seal those yet, okay? Uh, inside the, there, there's a couple of brochures. Those are yours, so you can take those out, put them in your pocket, put them in your purse. The most important thing I've ever written in my life is in your hand right now. It's called, What Do You Mean Born Again? Jesus said, except a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, there's a lot of opinions out there about what it means to be born again. So I felt like I wanted to write to the best of my ability in layman's terms so anybody can understand, what's that really mean? Because your eternal life depends on it. Jesus said, except a person is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So anyway, it's in your hands. It's probably a 10 or 15 minute read. That's yours. Take it home. Make notes in it. Mark it up. Uh, if there's something there you haven't done yet, well, get it done. Because we don't want one person to miss the rapture from an end time prophecy conference. Wouldn't that be a travesty? You go hear all about the second coming, the end time, and then the last trumpet sounds and your feet don't leave the ground. We don't want that to happen to anybody. So anyway, uh, read the brochure. Even if you think you've already done everything, you never know. You may learn something. So please do that right now. Uh, let me see here, just so I'll know who I'm talking to. How many of you subscribe to End Time Magazine? Would you raise your hand? 
Okay, several of you. I guess I probably should tell the rest of you it is required to make the rapture to subscribe. <laughs> Who's laughing? Well, it may not be absolutely required, but it may help you make the rapture. Uh, we try to put every two months the most critical articles that we feel like people need to really focus on because, you know, people can witness prophetic fulfillment and miss it. They had 100 specific prophecies about the first coming of Jesus and almost everybody on earth missed it. But not everybody did. Why did they miss it? Because they did not understand the prophecies. Now, we're right before the second coming. We're in a very similar time to that right now. We're right before the second coming. And we don't have a hundred prophecies. We have closer to a thousand. And yet the Bible teaches most people are going to miss the second coming. For the same reason. They don't understand the prophecies. Jesus said to the Jewish people, because you did not know the time of your visitation, their God walked their streets and taught in their temple. And they did not know who he was. We don't want that to happen to anybody. Don't you want in these end times really know what's going on and be able to anticipate everything? I'll tell you what. I get up excited. I go all day as hard as I can excited. I go to bed excited. I, I hate to go to bed, to tell you the truth. I wish I could do without sleeping, but I guess God knew what he was doing. I guess you have to do it. But I hate to do that because it seems like such a waste of time. Anyway... Uh, so, all right, has everybody got it signed up? At you, if you want to sign up for the magazine, there's a place right above where you, where you signed your name that you can subscribe to End Time Magazine. We would love to have you on board if you would like to do that. Okay, so put those away right now. Do not seal them yet, okay? Something else to be done later. But put those away right now, and we're going to get right into our lesson. Now, warning, this is a long lesson. I'm going to go as fast as I can, but it's a critical lesson. An important lesson. Has anybody heard about draining the swamp? Does anybody know what the swamp is? You're going to find out what the swamp is tonight. <laughs> from, <laughs> from a biblical perspective. All right? Our subject this evening, Master Plan of the Dragon. There is a master plan. As a matter of fact, the master plan was launched... In America, between 1913 and 1921. Wow, that's a while ago. About 100 years ago. I guess the first thing we should find out is, who is the dragon? We don't have to guess. The Bible tells us. Revelation 12, 9 says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the dragon is the devil and Satan. So what we're really talking about here tonight is Satan's master plan. Let me just reveal to you from the very outset what the devil's trying to do. It's in the Bible. It's very clear. In Revelation 13, 8, it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And then on down it says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So what is Satan's plan for every person in this room tonight? He intends for you to worship him. That's his master plan. And he will first of all use deceit to try to get you to worship him. But if that doesn't work, he's willing to use force. He has a plan to use force. He's even willing to kill those that will not submit. Now, I'm just here to tell you the truth, okay? I'll we'll tell you straight from the Bible. That is Satan's plan. Okay. So, the goal of Satan's master plan is to force every person on earth to worship Satan through a human being called the Antichrist. Remember when Satan tried to get Jesus to worship him? Remember that? 
He tempted him three different times. And each time, Jesus used the scriptures to rebuff him. So the Bible tells us, according to the scripture we've just now read, all will worship him except for one group of people, except those whose names are written in the land's book of life. So it becomes absolutely critical that every single one of us have our names written in the Lamb's book of life. Now the master plan is revealed in detail in Revelation 13. Believe it or not, Satan's whole master plan is revealed in one chapter. And you might know it would be chapter 13, right? It's always the devil's number. In Revelation 13, the entire chapter outlines in detail the master plan of Satan himself. The first eight verses talks about one world government. Then verse 11 through 15 talks about the one world religion. Verse 16 through 18 talks about the enforcement mechanism, the one world economy. Now, the whole deception is built around a concept Many people are teaching today that war is caused by conflicts among nations and by religious conflicts and by economic conflicts. So the theory is that if we could have one world government, one world religion, and one world economic system, then we would suddenly have peace and security. Now, don't forget this. This is Satan's master plan. This is his whole concept. Revelation 13 is devoted to one world religion and its leader, the Antichrist. One world, oh, I said that wrong. One world government and its leader, the Antichrist. One world religion and its leader, the false prophet. And one world economic system. That system is called the mark of the beast. Let's look, first of all, at the one world government. Remember, we're going to reveal the master plan of Satan for the earth tonight and also how it was enacted a hundred years ago in America and has been working ever since. Let's look at Revelation 13, 7. And it was given unto him, the Antichrist, to make war with the saints and to overcome them and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Now, this particular passage talks about a seven-headed, ten-horned beast, which is a symbol of the one world government. We're not going to go into detail because we don't have time. But I will tell you this, a beast in Bible prophecy always represents a nation or a kingdom along with the ruler of that nation or kingdom. And power was given to the Antichrist over all people and all nations. This is a picture of the end time one world government. Have you ever heard the term globalization? Our globalism, that came up a lot in our last presidential election. Well, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But let's go now to the one world religion there in Revelation 13, verse 11 through 15. And I beheld another beast come up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So the first beast has seven head, ten horns, body of the leopard, feet of the bear, mouth of the lion, ten horns of the ten horn kingdom. But the second beast, different. The second beast looks like a lamb. And when we think about a lamb in scripture, what do we think about? Jesus Christ, right? This beast looks like Jesus Christ, but he spake like the dragon. Who's the dragon? So he looks like Jesus, but he speaks like the devil. What a deceptive combination. And the Bible says he'll exercise all the, all the power of the first beast before him, and he will use his influence to cause the entire world to worship the Antichrist, the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, the false prophet influence is going to be vast because it says in this chapter that he will actually pull down fire from heaven in the sight of men. I'm talking about something that you're almost certainly going to witness personally. 
you will witness a major religious figure wave his hand and fire fall from heaven. And how you react to that will determine your eternity. Because most people are going to weep, they're going to clap, they're going to lift their hands, they're going to fall on their knees, they're going to worship. But in so doing, they're going to be deceived because he's going to use that power to convince everybody that the Antichrist has arrived, only he will not be called the Antichrist. He probably even will be called the Messiah. It's going to be mass deception. So that's what we have to really understand. Okay, let's look at the one world economy, verses 16 through 18. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man buy, buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. This is going to be for control. If you don't take the mark, you can't buy or sell. You'll have to have a number that you will use to participate in the economy. Has everybody got their number already here tonight? Anybody here does not have a social security number? Raise your hand. You've all got your number already? I think we're having this meeting too late. Kidding you. Just kidding. But you do realize it's awful hard to hold a job in America without that number, right? And you can't hold open a bank account without that number and you can hardly do anything without that number so as we can see the system is far advanced you say have I taken the mark of the beast or not you have not you can't take the mark of the beast yet because the beast is not here that will only happen during the time called the great tribulation but the network is being laid for it right now and it's not just in America it's worldwide all the people around the world are being given numbers and they're all functioning basically the same way. Why is Satan doing this? Because it's the best way to control people. If you can't eat, you get sort of cranky, don't you? You get upset. If you can't provide for your family, if you can't buy or sell, well, the Bible says that's the way it's going to be. You say, well, why not take the number? Well, it would be okay. There's nothing sinful about a number. But it would be okay, except they're going to require you to worship the beast to get your number validated. The Bible says that. You're going to have to worship the Antichrist, which will be probably a pledge of allegiance of some sort. And if you don't, your database down at wherever they're going to keep the records is going to show that you have not worshipped and not pledged allegiance to the one world governmental system. Therefore, have you ever stuck your card in a machine to get money and it comes back, you enter the wrong number or something, it comes back and says uh, authorization failed? Well, if you do that three times in a row, it'll eat your card. And you're going to go home without pizza. You're going to go home and eat bologna instead. So anyway, that's the way this whole system is going to work. I'm talking about in practical terms. In the present society in which we live, the mechanism is already set up right now to implement the mark of the beast. Why hasn't it already been set up? Because it's not time yet. You know, Jesus could not come early. The Bible says when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son into the world. So... When the Antichrist, when it's time for the Antichrist, I think he's alive on the earth right now. I'm almost positive he is. But he's not yet revealed because it's not time yet. And the mark of the beast is not implemented because it's not time yet. Now, listen, it's going to get better after a while. I know some of this information is a little dark. You're saying, ooh, I just sort of wish I wasn't here. I don't want to hear this. Some of you got earmuffs on, I can see out there. Anyway, anyway, uh, I got good news for you. I've lived in this prophecy world for over 50 years. And if you're not careful, studying prophecy can warp you. It can mess you up. And I was putting together a, a DVD on the Battle of Armageddon one day. And I kept reading about blood flowing the horse bridles and all these people that are going to die and everything that was going to go on. And 
I couldn't only take it anymore. So I did something I never do. My, my wife does it. She's not here tonight, so I'll talk about her. She does this. Sometimes she'll read the back of the book first. I caught her one day. She had just got a new book, and she's over there reading the back. I said, what are you doing? It was a mystery book. I said, what are you doing? You're going to run that book for yourself. She said, oh, no, I'm not. If it doesn't turn out right, I'm not reading it. <laughs> so that's who I married. Anyway. Well, I've never do that. That's just so against my nature. But I'll confess, I did it this time. I slipped over and read the last two chapters of our book, the Bible. And guess what? We win. They lose. So if some of this prophecy stuff gets to you a little bit, don't forget the last two chapters. All right. So this is about the enforcement mechanism. You will have to worship the beast or you will not be given your ability to buy or sell. And, oh, by the way, we're going to have question and answers tomorrow because I'm sure I'm creating a lot of questions in your minds right now. You know, some of you are already right now planning on moving to Utah and buying a bomb shelter or something like that. Maybe some of you go to Australia. Oh, by the way, we have people watching this program from New Zealand tonight, I was just told. Um, so New Zealand, hello, welcome. Because Alan Mouncey is with us from New Zealand and he, he informed me right before the service that uh, he's let them know that you're live streaming so they're able to watch. Okay. Now I stated, and let me state it again, Satan's master plan here in America was launched between 1913 and 1921. Most Americans are totally unaware. Let me tell you what happened. Three institutions were begun within an eight-year period. In 1913, the Federal Reserve Bank was created for the purpose of controlling America economically. We had not had it up till now. Then in 1916, the Brookings Institute was created it was designed to be a think tank to control the direction of the government, the foreign policy of the government, and to control what all of you think. Have you noticed that when you tune into the talk shows in the morning, if you'll listen to one for a while and then flip over and listen to the other one, they're all talking about the same thing because they got it from Drudge Report or from uh, USA Today or something. Somebody is feeding that monster. And they're controlling what everybody's thinking about on a particular day. Well, anyway, the Brookings Institute, that was their mission. And then in 1921, there was another organization formed, you may have heard about it, you may not have, called the Council on Foreign Relations. It was designed to control the government because they have been turning out politicians. They get them when they're really young, sometimes in high school. They send them to the right colleges, they nurture them up, and then all of a sudden they come out of nowhere. Where'd that guy come from? How's he catapulting to the top of everything? It's because the Council on Foreign Relations, it's their job. They're the incubator of all the politicians. So Council on Foreign Relations, thank you very much. Now, here's the real key. Listen close. One man participated in formation of all three of these institutions. One man. You may never have heard his name. But I want to introduce you tonight to Mr. Paul Warburg. Now remember what we're talking about, Master Plan of the Dragon. Now Mr. Paul Warburg was a member of the M.M. Warburg and Company banking family, one of the most powerful banking firms in Europe. In 1895... Paul Warburg married Nina Loeb, daughter of Solomon Loeb, the founder of Kuhn, Loeb, and Company, one of the most powerful bankers in America. This formed an alliance between Warburg and Company in Germany and the Kuhn, Loeb, and Company here in the U.S. Well, in 1902, Warburg decided to move to the United States since he married this daughter of uh, Kuhn, Loeb, and Company, and he became a partner in the Kuhn, Loeb, and Company banking system. He also remained a partner in the Warburg family firm in Hamburg, Germany. 
Now, all this ties into the scriptures before we're done, so try to remember all this. Now, because of Warburg's outstanding knowledge of banking, he quickly became very influential in the banking circles in the U.S., mostly centered in New York. Upon arriving in America, he began to write papers promoting the establishment of a central banking system. We didn't want a central banking system because once you put that much power in just a few hands, they end up controlling everything. So America had fought against it, but he began to write about the glories and the advantages of a central banking system. And soon he made a very powerful ally. Now, he was a banker, but he made a good political friend whose name was Senator Nelson Aldrich of Rhode Island, who was the czar of the Republican Party and chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. You say, why do I need to know this? Well, haven't you ever heard of Senator Nelson Aldrich? You have it. Have you ever heard of Senator Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller? Oh, yeah, wasn't he our vice president? Okay, just baiting you a little bit so you'll hang on with me until I can explain this whole master plan to you. Okay, well, while Warburg was circulating among all the bankers trying to get them to buy into this central banking system so that the bankers could gain control of the economy of the booming, emerging nation of America, they had a secret meeting. It happened in November of 1910 on a little island called Jekyll Island. Now, they didn't want anybody to know they were doing this, so they put out the word they were going duck hunting. They actually carried gun cases with them, but there were no guns in there. But they said they were going duck hunting, and they all went by their first names. They didn't let anybody know who they were. But at this meeting... Now, I can document every single thing I'm telling you. Don't think I can't document it. I can document it to the nth degree. Senator Aldrich, Paul Warburg, and four other experts sneaked off to discuss bank reform in America. How can we get control of the economy of the United States of America? So they went out of here to Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. Here's those in attendance. Henry Davison of Morgan Bank. Have you heard of J.P. Morgan Chase Bank? Most of you may be banking at Chase Bank right now. Well, they were there 100 years ago. Frank Vanderlip of National City Bank. Benjamin Strong, Vice President of Bankers Trust Company. And Piet Andrew, former Secretary of the National Monetary Commission and now Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. The real purpose of this historic duck hunt was to formulate a plan for U.S. banking and currency reform that Nelson Aldrich, who was in the Senate, he was the contact between the bankers and the government. So he was in the Senate and he could present it to the Congress. In case you're interested, I got a picture of their meeting place that you can see here on the screen. And during this secret meeting of these powerful banking interests, the general outline for the Federal Reserve Act was determined. Now, that was in 1910. And guess who was the principal author? Paul Warburg. Now, the purpose of the Federal Reserve Act, I'm talking about Satan's master plan in the United States of America. Follow this close. Because sooner or later, you're going to find out how this is affecting you. All right? So, the purpose of the, of the master plan was to place control of America's money in the hands of private bankers. If passed, the Federal Reserve Board would set interest rates and determine the amount of money in circulation, which was reserved to the Congress up till this time. They wanted to convince the Congress, you should give us, we're the experts, we're the money experts, we should be the ones to determine the money supply, set the interest rates, and so on. Now, let me tell you why this was so dangerous. Mr. Mayor Amschel Rothschild, from the Rothschild family, the most powerful banking firm of Europe, said, give me control of a nation's money, and I don't care who makes her laws. Here's a quote from one of the members at the meeting, the secret meeting in Jekyll Island. 
This comes from Frank Vanderlip, who was the president of National City Bank of New York. He said, if it were to be exposed publicly that our particular group, and he's talking about the elite bankers that met on Jekyll Island, if it was exposed that we had gotten together and written a banking bill, that bill would have no chance whatsoever of passage by Congress. But you know what they told the public and the media helped them to sell it? This is a bill that will save you from the big bankers. But it was written by the big bankers. Now politicians today would never do anything like that. But that's the way they did things back in those days. Okay. Well, so Nelson Aldrich, he's doing his work with all the politicians trying to sell them. And he couldn't really get enough votes together, but he had a plan. He knew most of the lawmakers liked to go home for Christmas. So two days before Christmas, when most of them were gone, on December the 23rd of 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was passed and became law. Now, I have to tell you something. This name is deceptive. Federal Reserve Bank. Sounds like a governmental agency, doesn't it? It's not. The Federal Reserve is controlled by private investors, by stockholders. Now, if you don't believe me, do your homework. I challenge you. And so this gave the money people of America control of the American economy. All right. You're going to see this a little bit more later on. All right. So Paul Warburg was the father of the Federal Reserve. Now, let's remember who he was. He moved to the United States in 1902, became a partner in Kuhn Loeb and Company, and he immediately began promoting the central bank, and he designed the Federal Reserve System when he wasn't even a citizen of America yet. Then he decided, well, I better become a citizen. So in 1911, he became a U.S. citizen. And then in 1913, when the first Federal Reserve Board was established, our President Woodrow Wilson named him as a member of the Federal Reserve Board. Only a citizen, two years. But now he's on this powerful, powerful board that is destined to control the United States of America's economy. All right. Now, this whole economic master plan was imported from Europe. Intimately acquainted with European central banks, especially the German Reichsbank, Warburg didn't claim to originate a new banking principles, any new banking principles, so much as importing European practices. Now, we had fled from Europe to get away from all those controlling things, but now they're sneaking in the back door and they're having this secret meeting out on Jekyll Island, and now they're grabbing hold of the economy of the United States of America. It's still true this night, by the way. I'll show you later. You've heard of the Federal Reserve, right? Okay. Now, what about the Brookings Institute? Well, it was founded in 1916. Tank designed to conduct research, write speeches for the presidents, uh, write policies, foreign policy for the government. I mean, the politicians don't have time to do that. They're out campaigning, they're kissing babies, they're meeting people. Somebody's got to be in the back room pounding out all these concepts as to what we should do and where we should go. Well, that's the Brookings Institute. And just to give you an example, a Brookings expert helped refine the blueprint for President Franklin Roosevelt's dream of the United Nations, which is now emerging as a one world government. So, guess who participated in the Brookings Institute? Paul Warburg became a trustee of the Brookings Institute, serving until the day he died. Hmm. Maybe we all just go get our guns and have a revolution. No, don't do that. I knew some of you rednecks were here. Anyway, anyway. So what about the Council on Foreign Relations? It was founded in 1921. Membership by invitation only. Anybody here ever have an invitation to become a member of the Council on Foreign Relations? Nobody. Not even Bishop Stanley. That's amazing to me. Founded in 1921, membership by invitation only. And its purpose is to influence America's foreign policy and to prepare its members for key positions in government. 
right here is the headquarters of the Council on Foreign Relations. And guess who was on the, the board as a director? Paul Warburg became a director of the Council on Foreign Relations at its founding in 1921 and remained on the board until he died. Hmm. I wonder what he's doing now. He's doing nothing. He's gone. But he has a son. So meet James Paul Warburg, the son of Paul Warburg. He stood before the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations on February the 17th of 1950, just to let you know what he's up to. And by the way, I took this myself. I copied it myself out of the congressional record so you can rely on this information. Here's what he said as he was testifying before the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. He said, we shall have a world government whether or not we like it. The question is only whether the world government will be achieved by consent or by conquest. You think he got that from his father, maybe? Then he went on to testify at the same meeting. I think the essential thing we should undertake is that we declare our willingness to participate in some sort of world organization capable of enacting, administering, interpreting, and enforcing world law. Whether you call it a federation, a government, or world order. Hmm, sounds an awful lot like Revelation 13, doesn't it? Anyway, so James Paul Orberg was an advisor to President Franklin D. Roosevelt during the time he was forming the United Nations, which was designed to be a one world government. Anybody ever notice the term new world order on the back of your dollar bill? You ever see it there? Well, unless you understand Latin, you didn't even know it was there. But if you look on the back of the dollar bill, there's a pyramid with a ribbon underneath it, and it says, Novus Ordo Seclorum. I took some Latin in school, believe it or not, and the word novus is new, the word ordo is order, and the word seclorum is secular or world. New world order on the back of our dollar bill. I thought, who in the world put that there? So I looked it up. I found out Franklin D. Roosevelt put it there in 1935. The same guy that was the driving force behind the United Nations, which is designed to be a one world government. Does anybody here believe we're in the end time? Why should it surprise us that all this stuff is happening? If we're in the end time, it shouldn't surprise us that all this is happening. But it's still a little bit jarring when we realize how much it's happening all around us. So Zane, James Warburg, he helped Franklin D. Roosevelt design the United Nations. And oh, by the way, you might like to know, he was also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. All right, let's jump ahead. What's the Federal Reserve today? Well, it meets every quarter uh, to either up the interest rates or to adjust them downward uh, so that if... I mean, everybody's poised the stock market with their finger on their computer. If they raise interest, they're going to sell, sell, sell because that's going to cause stock prices to go down. If they lower the interest, they're going to buy, buy, buy because now the stocks are getting ready to go up. And we've been doing this every three months for a long, long time now. So the Federal Reserve, they control the interest rates up or down and financial markets immediately respond. A few years back on my program, at the time it was called Politics and Religion, I was interviewing Ron Paul, Congressman Ron Paul, who at that particular time was chairman of the Subcommittee on Domestic and Monetary Policy. And I had noticed a little note in the newspaper a few weeks before that that said, Federal Reserve will no longer report on money supply. I looked at that because I, I knew from past reading that once a year they would publish how much money, how many dollars are in circulation. Well, if you can find out that the dollars in circulation have been shrunk, you can know they're tightening the economy. Or if it's been expanded, you know that they're blowing on it and, and it's getting ready to take off like a, a wild horse. So when I read that, I thought, they're getting ready to print money like there's no tomorrow, but they don't want us to know how much. They've just unilaterally said, we're not telling anybody anymore. So, 
That happened to me just a few weeks before I was interviewing Ron Paul, who was on the Financial Service Committee in our government and was the chairman of the Subcommittee on Domestic and Monetary Policy. So I couldn't wait to ask him. So I said to him, Congressman Paul, I noticed this article that the Federal Reserve's not going to tell us how much money's in circulation anymore. He said, yes. I said, do you know how much money's in circulation? You're, you know, you're the chairman of the Subcommittee on Domestic and Monetary Policy. He said, no. I said, can you find out? He said, no. I said, you're the chairman of the Subcommittee on Domestic and Monetary Policy, and you can't find out how much money's in circulation? He said, no. Well, remember 2008, big supposedly money crash that came along, and then the big bailout. I mean, the Congress had to agree to borrow trillions of dollars and to bail all, out all the big banks and everybody was everything was supposedly crashing and everything else. Well, about that time, at that time, the chairman of the Federal Reserve was a man by the name of Ben Bernanke. And they brought him before a Senate committee who's supposed to have oversight over the Fed. And they wanted to ask him some questions. I happened to see this on video. And it found out that millions went to foreign banks. Law, all the losses were shifted to the American taxpayer, even though the banks are the ones that made all the big mistakes, yet all the losses were shifted to you and me. And during that same year, the banks, some of them recorded record profits because I took the time to check out their end-of-the-year stock market reports because I was suspicious. You know, you got to do some really boring stuff when you teach Bible prophecy to find out some of this stuff going on anyway. But I read their stock reports and their uh, end of the year financials and they made record profits and furthermore some of their executives were paid huge bonuses supposedly for wrecking the economy and I thought does not compute well then to bail everything out to fix everything they got rid of the secretary of the treasury here in America and got a new one his name was Timothy Geithner he was the head of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So the Federal Reserve of New York, they're the ones in charge of the economy that messed everything up. So what do you do? You get the guy that messed everything up to fix it. Sort of like putting the fox in charge of the hen house. That's the type of thing that happened. So now then, he is put in there. Now, watch this by Henry Kissinger. Here's what Henry Kissinger had to say. He said... Who controls the food supply controls the people. Who controls energy can control whole continents. Who controls money controls the world. I suppose he should know. All right. So what is the Brookings Institute today? Well, let me take you back to 1992 because I saw Time Magazine on a shelf somewhere and and the title of one of the articles was Birth of the Global Nation. Well, I had been studying the prophecies of the Bible. I know the prophecies teach a one world government's coming. So when I see Time Magazine, the most widely circulated news magazine in America, with an article, Birth of the Global Nation, I bought a copy. It was July the 20th of 1992. And this particular article was written by Strobe Talbot. And he made a statement in this article, in the 21st century, national sovereignty as we have known it will cease to exist. We will all answer to a single global authority. I said, oh my goodness, that's what Revelation 13 says. And now I'm reading it in Time magazine. But who's this guy, Talbot? Well, a year after he wrote the article, he was brought to the White House by a president at that time, Bill Clinton, to be Deputy Secretary of State. And he served in that capacity for the next seven years. Well, then when the Clinton administration was over, he had to go find another job. And he found a really nice job. He became president of the Brookings Institute. Hmm. Well, then after he was there just a year or two, a lady joined his 
Brookings Institute, and she became a senior fellow for foreign affairs. Her name was Susan Rice. But she wasn't there long because a young man by the name of Barack Obama was running for president, and he called Strobe Talbot and says, Hey, Strobe, I need an advisor on foreign affairs. Don't have a lot of experience in that area. And Talbot says, got just the person for you, Susan Rice. Now remember, he believes the answer to the world, that there's going to be a one-world government in the 21st century. National sovereignty will cease to exist, will all answer to a single global authority. I read that in Time Magazine. I read that in Revelation 13. So now he's got Susan Rice working as her, his partner. When you hire someone, you usually want someone that sort of shares your goals. And she did. So now she leaves there, takes a leave of absence, and goes to the White House. Well, first of all, she participates in the candidacy of Barack Obama, and they win the election. Now we need somebody to represent us at the only forum in the world for a world government called the United Nations. Guess who became our ambassador to the United Nations? Susan Rice. So now we're sending her to New York to preach that sovereignty as we have known it will cease to exist in the 20th. Are you getting a little bit of a picture of the swamp? Okay. Well, anyway, let's keep going. Well, it was about that same time when all the financial crisis was happening in 2008, the end of the Bush administration, the beginning of the Barack Obama administration, I had to fly somewhere to speak somewhere, and I was getting on the plane, and they had a bunch of newspapers laid out there. You could choose one. That you, it was apparently going to be a long flight, and I don't remember where I was going. But anyway, um, I saw the Financial Times there. Well, the Financial Times is a daily publication. It's the most influential economic publication in the world comes out every day. All of the big economic people read it. Well, I, I'm not a big economic person, don't have a lot of money, but I wanted to see what they were talking about and what they were thinking, so I picked it up. Matter of fact, the story on the front page captured my attention. It said, and now for a world government. Financial Times, December 8, 2008. I said, they're not even hiding this anymore. They're putting it right on the front page in big, bold letters so I've got a couple of excerpts from this article for you so you can sort of get the flavor of it. It said, a taste of the ideas doing the rounds in Obama circles is offered by a recent report from the Managing Global Insecurity Project. Well, that's a project. How would you like to be in charge of that? Managing Global Insecurity. Sounds like a pastor's job to me. Anyway, I don't know. I don't want to manage the world's insecurity. I don't even want to manage your insecurity. Anyway, but that was the name of this group, this project that Obama had initiated and whose small U.S. advisory group includes John Podesta, the man who heading Mr. Obama's transition team, and guess who? Strobe Talbot. In this article, now for a world government, Strobe Talbot, president of the Brookings Institute, from which Mrs. Rice has just emerged. The article went on to say, the Managing Global Insta uh, Insecurity Report argues for the creation of a UN High Commissioner for counter-terrorist activity, to get rid of all terrorism in the world, a legally binding climate change agreement negotiated under the auspices of the United Nations, and the creation of a 50,000-strong UN peacekeeping force. Once countries have pledged troops to this reserve army, the UN would have first call upon them. In other words, the UN's going to have its own army. So we now have a UN High Commissioner on Human Rights, which is the counterterrorism. NATO has now become the global army of the United Nations, and they signed a treaty in Paris called the Paris Climate Accord, which... President Obama signed us on to without any authority. He couldn't get it through our Congress, so he just signed it and said, we're in. The problem with that, if you sign it and say, we're in, somebody else can come along, sign it and say, we're out, which just happened. Uh, President Trump just got us out. I, you know, I had somebody ask me, when President Trump burst on the world scene, says, is, is uh, Donald Trump in the prophecies of the Bible? 
I said, sure, haven't you ever heard of the last Trump? <laughs> it's it's, it's not, not your very good theology, but anyway. All right. Well, shortly after this, Strobe Talbot came out with a book called The Great Experiment. And you better believe I bought it. And I read it all the way through. It is a blatant endorsement. Don't even hide anything. He said the nation state system doesn't work anymore. All nations have their own army. When they get into conflict, they go to war. We'll never stop all this until we get rid of all the armies, put it under the United, put one army under the United Nations, and then the one army won't fight with itself. And I mean, he argues openly for this. I'm talking about the man who worked in the first big project even before President Obama took office during the transition phase. Phase. He's working with John Podesta, who, by the way, later on, helped Hillary Clinton with, with her campaign. Okay, now, I'm not, don't get all tied up about your politics, okay? I'll just tell you from the outset, politics is not the answer. Politics is Satan's method of ruling the world. The church is God's method of ruling the world. And we're getting ready to take over soon. I just said that before you walked out because I was afraid I might offend somebody. All right. So now what is the Council on Foreign Relations today? What's that come to 100 years later? Well, the CFR was kept secret for many years. Nobody even knew about it. But a few investigative journalists got to dig in and they noticed that these high, very prestigious people would disappear once a year and meet in secret places. And when they met... They would rent a whole, an entire hotel, and you couldn't get a room there. And they would have guards outside, and no one was allowed in unless your name was on a list. So anyway, uh, they founded the Council on Foreign Relations way back in, in uh, 1921, right? But finally, about maybe 50 years ago or so, some people begin to rip the cover off of it just a little bit. Today, approximately 50% of all cabinet members and this has been true over the last 50 years, have come from this private club called the Council on Foreign Relations. Whether the administration was Democrat or Republican. Now you can check it out. Take all of the cabinet members, whether the Republicans were in power or the Democrats were in power, and 50% of all the cabinet members. So consequently, the same stuff keeps happening no matter who's in power. You know, I had this sneaking feeling that I was voting for Tweedly D or Tweedly Dumb for a long time. Because I'd vote for somebody and they'd do the very thing I didn't want them to do. I voted for Richard Nixon to get rid of socialism. And he passed more social legislation than any president before him. And I voted for George W. Bush to move the embassy to Jerusalem. And he said he would do it the day of his inauguration. But he was inaugurated twice and I never heard a word. Never happened. Furthermore, he's the one that signed the Real ID Act, which set up a framework for the administration of the mark of the beast here in the United States. So I got off his bandwagon. Anyway, you're going to leave here either so happy or so mad by the time I get done. We'll see what happens. Okay. So Admiral Chester Wright, became a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. The CFR's goal, here's what he said, the CFR's goal is formation of an incrementally stronger world government. Admiral Chester Ward, former judge advocate of the U.S. Navy, was a CFR member for 16 years before resigning in disgust. He stated, the main purpose of the Council on Foreign Relations is promoting the disarmament of, the, of U.S. sovereignty and national independence and submergence into an all powerful one world government. That's his quote. So, Revelation 13, Master Plan of the Dragon. We're going to learn more. But we're going to pause for a moment because the Dragon, the Master Plan, is being enacted today. I'm going to explain it in a moment. However, let's pause. Would you get those envelopes back out that you signed a while ago? Would you pull those back out? 
because what I'm telling you tonight is going to involve every single person in this building. And if you know what's going on, you can use this material to show people that it's all prophesied in the Bible and that the Bible is the only answer for their lives. So if you can be educated to all this, God will use you. Matter of fact, the Bible says, during the time of the Antichrist, it says that he will corrupt many people by flatteries. But then it says, but they that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And in Daniel eleven thirty three, it goes on to say, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many. So if you know this stuff, you know, just ask somebody sometime, do you realize that 50% of all camp members come from a private club and have for the last 50 years, no matter who's in power? Well, that's a good conversation piece. Um, but the point is this, and this is what is so very, very important. The point is, it's being enacted right now because we are now in the end time. Now, I did not come here to tell you the end time is coming. I have come here to tell you adamantly you are in the end time at this very moment. And this is the time the church cannot sit by paralyzed and immobilized. It is time for God's people to be up and about their father's business as never before. But if we don't know what's going on, we'll sort of be thrown into neutral. And we won't know what to do. So they that understand among the people, shall instruct many. <coughs> so get those envelopes back out because we're not here tonight just to have a meeting. We are here to launch a movement. And this movement will involve every single person here. We have produced a course called Understanding the End Time. Now, I know this is an in-depth lesson and I've been throwing stuff at you so fast, your head may be swimming right now. But this course called Understanding the End Time consists of 14 lessons. And you go through this course, I'll make you a promise. You'll know more about Bible prophecy than 95% of the graduates from theological seminary. Because God gave us prophecy for now. He said in Daniel 12, 9, Daniel tried to understand his own writings. God said, no. Sealed up. This is for the people of the time of the end. So the prophecies of the Bible were written for our generation right now. And he gave them to us so that it could feed the flames of one last great end time revival. But if we don't know the prophecies, we can't participate. God cannot use us. They that understand among the people shall instruct many. So we've produced this course and we actually named it from that verse. Understanding the end time. But if you don't get through this course, it will do you no good. So what I want to do, my number one goal of being with you tonight and tomorrow morning, is to get every single person in here through this course. Now, if I were, if I were the king of Garland, you would do this. I would pass an executive order. If you didn't show up, you'd go to jail. I'd just force you to do it. I'm not the king of Garland. Can't do that. It's America, thank God. But I'm doing my very best to persuade you. Starting Monday evening at 7 o'clock, I will be teaching here in this facility this 14-week course. Now, I don't get to be here physically, but I'll be here by way of DVD. I'll be here as big as Dallas. It's going to be right there on the screen. So anyway, I'm going to teach through this course. By the time you get done, you will have material in your hands that will really help you. You'll understand the end time. We tried to structure this course so we'll show you which nations will be a part of the end time one world government and the Bible explicitly teaches which. What's going on with all the religions of the world? How's this thing all going to unfold? And what should the true church of Jesus Christ do? That's the most critical question of all. So anyway, um, how many of you 
have been through all 14 lessons. Would you raise your hand? Okay, let me see what I got here. Maybe 5%, maybe 10. All right, the rest of you, you're my target. I want to get you through these lessons ASAP. Because you simply, I don't think any person should live through the next six months to a year without understanding what's going on. You won't even understand the swamp. I haven't even fully described the swamp to you yet. What is that? Have you heard of the establishment? Okay, the CFR is the establishment. They're the ones that determine who ends up being nominated. They give you two candidates. You can vote for either one. It don't make any difference. Same old, same old is going to keep on happening. At least that's been true until lately. There's a whole lot of screaming and squealing going on lately because somebody that was not a part of the establishment sort of slipped in the side door. And now we're having all kinds of stuff happening. Well, anyway, okay. So what am I asking you to do? Down at the bottom where you signed your name in red, there's a place to say, I want to enroll in the end time course, the end time classes. Check that box. And then show up here every Monday at 7 o'clock. You say, I've got an appointment. Cancel it. But I was supposed to meet President Trump next Monday. Great. Bring him with you. He needs it. Right? We have an in-time representative that just met with Mike Huckabee last week. And he handed them two of our DVDs. America's God-Given Destiny and our newest DVD, Trump, Jerusalem, and Armageddon. And he, we asked him to get them to President Trump. Now, well, are us poor, pitiful Pentecostals going to always sit on the sideline and suck our thumb? Or are we going to get out of the bleachers, get in the arena? It's time for us to go. Because we got the answers. The Bible's got the answers. Uh. He said, man, you're crazy. Yeah, I'm crazy like a fox. <laughs> anyway, whatever, whatever. Okay, so have you checked that box yet? Okay, obey me. Check the box. Do you, please. All right, I'm doing my best to persuade you. Be here. You say, how much is this going to cost? Well, it should cost you $10,000 a piece. And that'd be cheap. It's going to save your life. It's going to save your family. It's going to save your business. However, you're sitting in a wonderful church right now that knows the value of this, and they paid for it for you. And it's not going to cost you anything. I'm a little bummed out about this because this is my life's work. And they're giving away free for nothing. But it's a chance for you to do this. And I promise you, you'll never be sorry. You'll understand things you've never understood before. And we're smack dab in the middle of it right now. We are walking straight through the halls of Bible prophecy right now. And it's awful easy to be right in the middle of what God is doing and not have a clue. So we don't want that to happen to you. Okay, have you checked the box? All right. Maybe you need to poke your neighbor and say, check the box. All right. Um, you say, what's going to happen? Before I commit, what's going to happen? You're going to show up here at 7 o'clock. I'm going to teach one hour. Then they're going to give you a, a test. Say, if they're giving a test, I'm not coming. I took my last test 40 years ago. <laughs> I'm not coming. Well, got good news for you. We're going to let you cheat. You'll get to grade your own. Nobody's going to know how you do except you, okay? So you're going to take the quiz, and it'll contain about 10 or 12 questions, things you really need to retain from that week's lesson. And then after you go through it, then we're going to give everybody the answers. We're going to go through them one by one, and the moderator will give everyone the answers. So if you don't get it right, you can... Scratch out the wrong answer, put in the right one. So when you walk out the doors, you're going to know the answer to these questions. So you're going to be understanding the end time. All right? That's what it's all about. Okay, so that's what's going to happen. Come as you are. You'll be out of here in about an hour and 20 minutes or so. 
and it's going to be an exciting adventure for all of us. All right. Uh, one other thing I'd like to ask you to do, uh, End Time Ministries is fully engaged. Uh, we, we took a survey recently. We have 35 full-time employees. We have a college in Jerusalem. We have an a, a, um, online college with over 800 students now. And we're pushing the pedal as far as clear to the floor. And so we wanted to find out how effective we're being. We're on radio. We're on television. We have End Time Magazine, the most widely circulated prophecy magazine in the world, as far as we know. Um, we do conferences everywhere. We're on social media. So I challenged our supervisors. I said, I want to know how many people we're reaching per month. So they came back, and they uh, made their reports to the best that we could calculate. And we calculated. They said, we got it. we're reaching about 220 million people per month. Well, I thought, whoa, that's pretty good. I thought that for about 10 seconds, and then all of a sudden I thought, wait a minute. There's 7 billion people on this planet. They were not doing so good. The point is this. We've got to accelerate fast because we're running out of time. So anyway, if you'd like to be a partner with End Time Ministries, there is a place in the upper left-hand corner that you can say, okay, I want to be a partner. Sign me up. And uh, if you want to give 50 bucks a month, $20 a month, $100 a month, whatever you want to give, just put it in. I think there's a place to market there. You say, I'm not going to do that because what if I can't do it? Hey, if you say you're giving 25 bucks a month and you don't do it, you're going straight to hell. <laughs> you know, some Christians don't ever have any fun. Anyway, anyway. No, the truth of the matter is, we won't even call you. We won't even send the sheriff to your door. All you're saying is, if God will bless me, this is what I'd like to do. I'd like to stand with you. And you say, what do I get in return? I write a personal letter to all of our partners once a month, telling them the latest breaking news, what I think is critical, and what's going on inside End Time Ministry. So you really become a partner with us. So if you'd like to do that, we'd love to have you on board. It would be a great blessing, and we need to grow. We need to double and double and double again because we're running out of time. Okay, there's one last thing I need. Oh, yeah, most important thing. Uh, we would like to receive an offering tonight to take care of the expenses of this meeting and also to push the work of End Time Ministries ahead. So if you'd like to write a check, make it out to End Time, E-N-D-T-I-M-E, -E, that simple. If you'd like to use your credit card, there's a place on your envelope where you can enter your credit card information and you can give that way. If you're here and you can't give or don't choose to give, we're still really, really happy that you're here. So that's up to you, whatever you'd like to do. Our ushers are coming right now. Now, please put your envelope in if you don't have anything to give because if major prophecies happen, we want to let you know. If we find out the Lord's coming in three days, would you like to get a quick email? Okay, we can't do it if you don't have to provide your information. So put your envelope in regardless, all right? And by the way, we're on the brink of big, big prophetic fulfillments. All right, would you please bow your heads right now? Wonderful Lord Jesus, thank you for your many blessings. Lord, I thank you for all these wonderful people that are here on Saturday evening. They could be anywhere they want to be. But we thank you because they've chosen to be here to hear your word. But Lord, beyond that, I'm asking you to use each of them in these closing days of time, just before your second coming. I'm asking you to show each of them what you want them to do, and I'm asking you to empower them to do your will. That's our number one desire. Thank you, Lord. We're praying your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and we know that's getting ready to happen. Bless this offering now. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, while the offering is being received, let me talk to you while this is happening. We'll save time that way. By the way, ushers go slow because sometimes people are wrestling with their um, envelope, and so make sure you go slow. But let me tell you what's out on our table because a crowd this size will overwhelm our personnel that's out there. Uh, they'll not be able to answer all your questions. You'll get frustrated. So let me tell you what's out there. The course that will be provided here, if for some reason you'd like to own it, it's out there available to you. 
It's 14 one-hour DVDs. It's called Understand the End Time in a Packet. If you'd like to own it, a lot of people like to have it for their Sunday school classes, for their small groups. A lot of pastors use it for their weekly Bible study. Or a lot of people just want it for their own personal research and study. Anyway, it's out there. It's called Understand the End Time. Now, since we did that 14 DVD series, there have been a lot of other things happened, a lot of things that were not covered in the original Understand the End Time series. So we've done 14 more DVDs covering such things as, will Islam rule the world? Is the Antichrist going to be a Muslim? Uh, do you have to go on to church on Saturday in order to be saved? You know, there's a, a pretty big movement here in America that teaches that if you go to church on Sunday, you've taken the mark of the beast. They really teach that. Um, and so I had that question. So many times we produced a DVD called To Sabbath or Not to Sabbath. Should we be keeping the Sabbath today as they did in the Old Testament, or how should we keep it today? So anyway, uh, that's answered in that particular thing. When will the rapture happen? That's always a key question a lot of people want to know, and a lot of other things. They're out there in that additional 14, and then there are many other things out there that you would be interested in. I'm not going to take the time to tell you about them. I will tell you this. We do have a university called End Time University. You can ask them out there. They'll tell you all about it. And so a lot of things going on. Okay, let's finish up. You ready? Now, Dragon's Master Plan is being enacted right now. Let's get some proofs. World government. Have you heard of globalization? Have you heard of the international community? Have you heard of the world community? Have you heard of global governance? Have you heard of the new world order? Are those just words being flung around, or do they have meaning? Furthermore, uh, for example, when President Obama wanted to go against Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, it was really strange. He did not ask our U.S. Congress for permission, even though that's where the power to declare war is supposed to be, according to our Constitution. Instead, he went to the U.N. Security Council on a Monday, and we were dropping bombs on Muammar Gaddafi on Tuesday. So he used the power of the world government, the UN Security Council, for his uh, progress. And there were so many people in Congress that agreed that the United Nations need to really be where the power lies, that they didn't stop him. Furthermore, it was in 2005 that there were people pushing for a new aspect of the United Nations. The United Nations, when its original charter was provided, only provided for the UN to arbitrate between nations when they had conflict. It was forbidden from dealing inside the domestic affairs of a nation. However, in 2005, and I happened to be at that meeting as a journalist at the United Nations, I was there when Kofi Annan informed all the journalists. I was sitting beside Reuters and, and ABC and CBS and all of them. I was there in the press room. And uh, Kofi Annan came and said, I've got something you're going to be really excited about. We have put in the outcome document of this year's annual UN General Assembly a new provision, the responsibility to protect. We've reached the point now where if an unscrupulous government gets in power, where do they turn to? Because we're forbidden from interfering with domestic things. Well, now the nations are ready to change that, and they passed a new stance called responsibility to, pr to protect. And if they feel like, in their judgment, that a, a ruler is violating the human rights of his subjects, the UN has a responsibility to go in, remove that ruler, and replace it with a government to UN liking. Uh, there was a statement that was issued at that particular time Sovereignty is no longer a right, but a privilege that can be revoked by the world community. That's a scary statement. That the world community can now overthrow any government it disagrees with and replace it with a government to its liking. Now, I know what I'm talking about. I was sitting there when the Secretary General of the UN announced this. I knew it was coming. I had heard they were working on it but it was a stunning experience to actually be there and witness it firsthand. Okay, now, who all believes in world government? 
Listen to the words of President George Bush Sr., who was, what, our 41st president of the United States. Listen to what he has to say about the New World Order. For future generations, a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. Mr. David Rockefeller, who, by the way, was president of the Council on Foreign Relations and was also the chairman of the board of Chase Manhattan Bank for many, many years. He published his memoirs in 2002, and on page 405, I happen to own the copy of this book, here's what he said. For, many, for more than a century, ideological extremists at either end of the political spectrum has seized upon well-publicized incidents such as my encounter with Castro to attack the Rockefeller family for the inordinate influence they claim we wield over American political and economic institutions. He went on to say, some even believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interest of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I am proud of it. Straight from the memoirs written by the hand of David Rockefeller. Listen to what he else he said. He said this about New World Order in 1994. This present window of opportunity during which a truly peaceful and interdependent world order might be built will not be open for too long. We are on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. So all we need is a really, really good crisis. And we'll be able to install the new world order. Now, Henry Kissinger has been one of the leading authorities on foreign affairs over the last 75 years here in the United States of America. He was also the right-hand man to David Rockefeller that I just read from his memoirs. As a matter of fact, when Rockefeller was president of the Council on Foreign Relations, Henry Kissinger worked for him. I was a full-time employee of the CFR. Now, he also then became, after working for the CFR, he became the National Security Advisor to President Nixon and then became our Secretary of State. Now, here's what Henry Kissinger had to say about the New World Order, and it's not easy to understand this because he has such a strong German brogue. So we've written the words he's saying down below, but we want you to take a look at it. Here we go. Uh, but he can give a new impetus to American foreign policy, partly because the reception of him is so extraordinary around the world. I think his task will be to develop an overall strategy for America in this period when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity. It isn't just a crisis. Now, this was right during the big economic crisis. He spoke this in January of 2009. And Obama was just coming to power, and Kissinger said, because he is being received so with such extraordinary enthusiasm, we got a real shot at this new world order. Okay, that's, what, that's where we are with world government, only it's much further advanced now. But let's look at the, the proofs of a world belief system. Mikhail Gorbachev, in his book, uh, Perestroika, which was published in 1987, he said, we must extirpate all genocide, apartheid, and religious exclusiveness. We must replace it with religious inclusiveness. Now, if you don't know what the word extirpate means, you're not too worried about it. But extirpate means to kill off. So we must kill off all genocide, apartheid, and religious exclusiveness. 
If you believe you must believe in Jesus as the Messiah to be saved, you are guilty of religious exclusiveness. That's the reason that in the public sphere, now then there's tremendous pressure. If you pray in any public gathering, don't say in the name of Jesus. Just say in the name of our God because we have to be religiously inclusive. I experienced that firsthand. I was asked to pray at one of our meetings at the Richmond High School many years ago. And I was glad, I was honored to be asked to do it. And about two weeks before time for the meeting, the man who invited me called up and said, listen, there's going to be a lot of different type of people there. Could you possibly not use the name of Jesus in your prayer? I said, sir, you better get someone else. I can't do that. He said, no, no, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. But boy, did I feel pressure that day. Okay, well, anyway. So, interfaithism. It's a new word, but it's very rife in our world today. There was the United Religions Initiative that has now been founded in the year 2000, the Parliament of the World's Religion. Uh, there is a course called Faith and Globalization, founded by Mr. Tony Blair. He has partnered with Yale University. He believes, when he left the Prime Ministership of Great Britain, he believes that the New World Order, that globalization is driving us together so much that is drawing religions into conflict because used to we sort of say step, stay separated. But he said, now that we're being driven so close together, we've got to find a way to understand each other. So he and Bill Clinton got together and they found a new, uh, new uh, project called Face to Faith. And in high schools, they're putting screens, computer screens, on the desk of every student and if you're a Christian, they hook you up with a Muslim somewhere in the world. Or if you're a Muslim, they hook you up with a Buddhist. Or if you're a Buddhist, they hook you up with a Zoroastrian or something. And they try to say, don't talk about your differences. Talk about your, the things that you agree on. And they're trying to train everybody that all religions really are equally valid. And that we all really worship the same God. That's the big doctrine. That everybody worships the same God. The Jews, Muslims, Christians, they all worship one God. It's the same God. Now, if you think that I am not telling you the truth, take a listen to our president, George W. Bush, the 43rd president of the United States. Do we all worship the same God, Christian and Muslim? I think we do. Does. We have different routes of getting to the Almighty. Do Christians and non-Christians, do Muslims go to heaven in your mind? Yes, they do. We have different routes of getting there. I did too. Are y'all listening to me? I'm telling you, the Bible prophesies that one world government, a one world religion, now let's talk about religious inclusiveness. When President Obama was elected, his inauguration in early 2009, he had three inaugural services actually. On the first day, Muslims and Jews were invited to offer the prayers. A few days later, on the second inauguration, Gene Robinson, an open homosexual Episcopalian bishop, was asked to pray. On the third inaugural service, Rick Warren was asked to represent the evangelicals to pray. What's the message that President Obama was sending? Muslim, Jew, Christian, homosexual, I'm okay, you're okay, nothing's wrong, everything's okay. Now, dictators have always attempted to control the beliefs of their subjects. Remember when Nebuchadnezzar had his big image and said, everybody bows down or you're going to the fiery furnace? So this thing is not new. What's coming next is not new. When the Antichrist says, you either bow down and worship me or else you're going to uh, have your number rescinded and you won't be able to buy or sell, that's not a new deal. It has always happened from time to time to time. Now, let's talk about religious inclusiveness. I'm, I'm drawing to a close. Revelation 13, 15. Now, the prophecy here in Revelation clearly states that people will be forced to embrace a global belief system. Here's what it says. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that's the Antichrist, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Wow. They're going to get serious about this, aren't they? 
Now here's what Mr. Hans Kuhn said. He said, there will be no peace among the nations without peace among the religions. There will be no peace among the religions without dialogue among the religions. And this was formulated by Dr. Hans Kuhn, a professor of ecumenical theology and president of the Foundation for a Global Ethic. They now have founded a United Nations of Religions. It's called the United Nations Initiative. I was there at the day they founded it at Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I was there when they had Catholics and Buddhists and Muslims and Jews, and they tried to get me to sign their original charter. I said, no thank you. But I watched it all happen. One world government, one world religion. Now how does God view all this? Well, we know the Tower of Babel was the first global religious system. They said, let's just build a tower, and if there's another flood, we can run up the tower, and we won't be drowned. So it was the first effort at man-made religion. Well, God was against that and blocked it. He confused their languages. And then in the book of Revelation, God spends two chapters out of 22 absolutely pronouncing horrible judgment upon the one world religion of the false prophet of the end time. Chapter 17 and chapter 18 takes two chapters out of 22 to renounce false religion. Why do you hate false religion so much? Because you'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. If you believe a lie, you'll be damned. we got to preach the truth. We need to know the truth. And we don't need to worry about my grandma did this and her grandma did this and all this. You can't be tied like that. We need to go back to biblical Christianity because the Bible prophesies that most religions, most Christian religions, both Catholic and Protestant, are getting ready to go right into a one world religious system. The Bible teaches that the Pope, whoever he is, whoever's Pope at the time of the Antichrist will be the false prophet. Now I'm just laying it out here for you. And I don't mean to be unkind because you know Catholic prophecy books teach the same thing? I have them in my possession. Catholic prophecy books teach there's an evil pope coming and during his day, Rome will be destroyed. Well, guess what? The Bible says during the day of the false prophet, Rome will be destroyed. And I can prove to you conclusively that's going to happen. But yet the Bible says concerning both Catholics and Protestants, when this one world church reaches its full momentum, Come out of her, my people. There's a lot of good people in those different denominations. And God says, come out of her, my people, lest you be a partaker of her sins and receive of her plagues. And that may affect many of us here tonight. But you'll understand all that better as you go through this course. <coughs> now, Mystery Babylon, as mentioned in Revelation 17, will be the last man-made religion. What about world economy? World Bank... International Monetary Fund, World Trade Organization, Global Economy, and then when they had the big financial crisis in 2008, early in 2009, they established a new organization called the Financial Stability Board. I'm not going to take time to explain it all to you, but it's designed to be a board that oversees all the financial institutions of the entire world. I'm telling you, the government has imposed so many financial controls on the banks. You know, when you go to open an account, they're going to ask you a lot of intrusive questions. And they put it under the name of know your customer. But I had a banker tell me, I'm required by law to ask those questions. And if you deposit more than $5,000 cash, they send a suspicious activity report on you. And you're going to be investigated because they're keeping track of every penny, every dollar, because they know that finance is the means of control. Now, again, I'm just throwing this out at you. All those things are true. So, economic control, what's the enforcement plan? Well, we have a problem with borders. Have you, have you heard lately There's borders are a big political uh, dispute? Well, there's one way to fix it. If everybody had a number, then you could track people worldwide. Not a problem. So a national ID would be the key to surveilling everybody. If everybody's got a national ID card, 
then they can keep track of you all the time. Matter of fact, if you've got a cell phone, <laughs> anybody here got a cell phone? They know where you are all the time. You commit a crime, I guarantee they're going to subpoena your records. And you can say you were in Texas the day that crime happened. But if they know you were in Baltimore, Maryland, they're going to track your cell phone, track you down. And for long, you're going to have handcuffs on your hands. Just don't commit any crimes. Anyway, there are people who are pushing a national idea, as a matter of fact. As of this year, unless you have your national ID, you won't get on an airplane. Do you see those signs in the airports lately? You must have a, the real ID, which is real identification in America. I wouldn't be surprised if they don't spread that. You'll have to have that card for, um, uh, for holding a job. They're pushing this right now. As a matter of fact, in this new agreement they're trying to put together on immigration, I've got to write an article for our magazine against it. They're trying to put in a national ID. We have fought against national ID since the founding of this country 240 years. They've tried to pass it again and again. We've always fought against it because that's the way you set up tyranny. If you have everybody have a number and they've got to have that number, then you can track everybody. It's a method of control. Has it dawned on you yet that control... And freedom are opposite terms. Used to in America, you're inside America. They didn't track you. I remember just what before 911, I went to get on the airplane. I gave no ID. I didn't go through any X-ray machines. I just had on my boarding pass and walked on. It's called freedom. But now, through fear, we have been enslaved. Okay. I gotta finish. So the national ID is gonna be required ultimately to hold a job, so on and so forth. You say, well, how are we gonna deal with all this? You'll be here tomorrow, I'm gonna to tell you how to deal with it all. Matter of fact, I'm gonna give you a chance to ask the questions. We'll be answering all these questions. So the global ID is gonna be the key to world government, Revelation 13, 17, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So once a global ID is fully implemented, Every person on earth can be tracked 24-7. National borders will become irrelevant, and the purpose of a national ID is control, control, control. You know what? When I saw this, and I was putting this lesson together, I thought, God, who's the brilliant mastermind that's controlled? I mean, somebody's got to be really, really, really organized. They've got to be brilliant to devise Council on Foreign Relations and Brookings Institute and Federal Reserve. And there's a thousand of those organizations out there. And they're all interlocking. God, who's run this whole thing? There must be some brilliant person on the planet. And then the Lord showed me who was running it. I found it in the Bible. Revelation 13, 1 and 2. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast... Rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon its horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were the feet of a bear, his mouth was the mouth of the lion. Now we find out who's running this whole thing. Watch. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Satan is the mastermind. That's putting this whole thing together. You see, is the United Nations of the devil? Absolutely. It's going to be the structure that the Antichrist is going to use to run his one world government. You say, how do I escape? Good reason for you to be here tomorrow. Now, the last thing I'm going to show you tonight. Are you old enough to remember Walter Cronkite? He was called America's Newsman. Everybody was so anxious because you haven't heard the news until Walter Cronkite gives it. However, not everybody knows who Walter Cronkite really was because after he retired, he worked very diligently for one world government. And he worked so diligently for it that the World Federalist Organization gave a prize each year to the person that did the most to promote world government. It's called the Norman Cousins Award. Well, Walter Cronkite was given this award in the year 2000. 
And I have his acceptance speech on video. I want you to hear it. First, we Americans are going to have to yield up some of our sovereignty. That's going to be, to many, a bitter pill. It would take a lot of courage, a lot of faith, a lot of persuasion to them to come along with us on this necessity. Today, we must develop federal structures on a global level to deal with world problems. We need a system of enforceable world law, a democratic federal world government. Pat Robertson has written in a book a few years ago that we should have a world government, but only when the Messiah arrives. <laughs> he wrote, and literally, any attempt to achieve world order before that time must be the work of the devil. Well, join me. I, I'm glad to sit here at the right hand of Satan. I'm glad to sit here at the right hand of Satan. At the right hand of Satan. <laughs> Let's all stand. Before you leave, I'd like to ask everybody in the building to quickly come up here to the front. I want to have a closing prayer with you. Please come, everyone. Thank you very much for your cooperation. I appreciate it so much. That's it. Keep right on coming. Make room for everybody behind you. There's plenty of room up here. So, I brought you up here because I'm very glad to tell you that God has a blueprint for your life individually right now. There is a blueprint authored by God himself for your life. Don't you want to fulfill that blueprint? Oh, I want to so bad. I do need to warn you, though. There's not one blueprint for your life. There's two. Satan also has a blueprint for your life. And you and I hold a, an awesome power called the power of choice where we will either choose to follow God's plan or Satan's plan. Now, I would think most of you here tonight want to follow God's plan. You probably wouldn't even be here tonight. However, how do we do that? I mean, you can say, I want to, but I don't even know where to start. That's what I want to do before you leave. I want to quickly tell you what you can do from this night forward to begin enacting God's plan in your life. Now, many people have had a mistaken idea. When I was just a teenager, we had a preacher come preaching through, and he quoted one of the reformers and said, this reformer made the statement, it remains to be seen what God could do with one person totally committed to Jesus Christ. And I remember that, and I thought, whoa, I hope I live to see somebody like that. And I had a little thought in the back of my brain. Maybe you could do it. And I thought, oh, no, 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 no. I'm way too weak. I could never do that. And so I spent the next 20 or 30 years of my life growing up in church sort of looking for this super Christian that would come blazing through. And we had some great preachers come through, and I thought, maybe this is him. One of them had a head-on automobile accident. Others had other problems. Didn't happen. A few years ago, I felt like the Lord was talking to me. He said, you know that concept you got about the super Christian thing? And about how that total commitment is, is like almost impossible. That's wrong. And he took my mind to the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, keep the commandments and named them off. And the man said, I've done them all from my youth up. And Jesus, beholding him, loved him. 
But the young man knew he still didn't have the goods. And he said, what do I like yet? Jesus said, well, if you're really serious about this, I see that you got one thing between you and me. You love your money more than you love me. So in your case, sell what you've got, give to the poor, take up your cross, follow me. And what happened to the young man? He walked away, bowed his head, said, can't do it. He was unwilling to totally commit. It's like the Lord said to me, don't you understand that repentance is when you die to self and give yourself to me with no reservation? So total commitment is not something for some super Christian. Total commitment is required for salvation. Change my life forever. So. Maybe you've even thought you repented, but you've never totally committed. I'm going to call you to true repentance tonight. To total, you say, but what if I do this and then I go out tomorrow and mess up? No problem. Because it's like God said to me, you can't do better than your best. I'm not calling you to do better than your best. Do your best. I'll do the rest. Okay? Because if you'll do your best, God will make up for the rest. Doesn't the Bible say, if we walk in the light, as we have the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ continues to cleanse us from all sin and unrighteousness. Growing up in church, I had a wonderful mom and dad, and dad preached it straight as an arrow. And I'm so glad he did. But I never could quite jump as high as I thought I should jump. Could never quite live up to it. And so I lived under condemnation. I'll just confess. Most of the time I lived under condemnation because I never thought. I was out holding revivals. Get, seeing people get saved. And I still wondered if I'd make the rapture if it happened. And I thought, God, this is not right for me to live like this. You said there's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And I lived my whole life filled with condemnation. I was messed up. But then it dawned on me that once you're born again, once you repent and you're in Christ, now the blood, you know, you got blood thrown, flowing through your veins right now. Check your pulse. You got blood flowing through your veins right now. And the same God that made you physically also will make you spiritually. And you'll have spiritual blood. And you know what your blood does physically? You know those Twinkies you ate today you knew you shouldn't eat? That blood purifies that junk out, that Diet Coke, all that stuff. So the blood of Jesus, the same God that made your physical blood and made your spiritual blood. And the Bible says if we walk in the light, as we have the light, as long as we're doing our best to please God... Then the blood of Christ continues to cleanse us. Continues. I'm clean 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's therefore now no condemnation. It's a great way to live. Now I, I said, whoa, God, I can do this. I will do my best. Now, you say, man, if that's that easy, I've got some bars I've been wanting to go to. Get, let me out of here. No, 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 no. I said you've got to do your best. You do your best. He'll make up the difference. And what a wonderful life it is. And it all starts with a decision. And that is re true repentance where you give him everything. That means he owns your life. He owns your money. He owns your bank account. He owns your business. He owns your family. And then finally, the hardest part, he owns you. Now, that's what we need in this end time. God wants to own us all because he wants to use us all. He's got a blueprint. God wants to use you, sir, ma'am. I'm telling you, God's got a plan to use you because this is the end time and we're running out of time. You say, oh, I'm too old. No, no, no. We're all the same age. We all got the same number of years left. We're about out of years, all of us. <laughs> I 
I, I've solved this age problem. I'm having my birthdays backwards. Every year I get one year younger. I've got to. We've got too much work to do. All right. All right. So now we're going to, before you walk out the door, what I want to do, I want to lead you in a prayer of repentance. We're going to give him everything. If you want to, now, if you don't want to do this, don't do it. Now, what's the sign in the Bible of total commitment? Does anybody know? Somebody stick a gun in your ribs, what do you do? That means take my watch, take my wallet, don't pull that trigger. That's what that means. I would the men everywhere would lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Let's do it right now. Would you tell him right now, God, you got me. You got all of me. I love you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. I worship you, Savior. Oh, God, I want you to use me. Lord, I'll do my best. I know I'm weak, but when I'm weak, then I am strong. Oh, Lord, I'm asking you today, be with us. Help us. We thank you, Jesus. We're excited, Lord. Oh, God, we worship you. We praise you. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. While you got your hands up there, would you tell him how much you love him right now? I love you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. I thank you, Jesus. I praise you, Lord. I love you, Savior. Now put your hands together. Let's praise him a little bit. I love you, Jesus. I praise you, Father. Hallelujah. 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 Woo. Oh, hallelujah. He's going to win. The devil's going to lose. I'm going to be on the winning side. Okay. Tomorrow at 10 o'clock, we'll be right back here. We're going to be dealing with breaking prophetic fulfillments. I'll show you where the recognition of Jerusalem by President Trump as the capital of Israel is in the Bible and other things. Anyway, we've got some stuff to talk about tomorrow morning, and then we'll open up for your questions and answers. Hallelujah. Man, anybody excited? Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, everybody talks about how terrible Armageddon is going to be. Armageddon is not going to be terrible. It's going to be wonderful. You know what happens in Armageddon? Jesus comes back. Antichrist, the false prophet, goes to the lake of fire. Satan goes to the bottomless pit. We crown Jesus king of kings and lord of lords. That's what's going to happen in Armageddon. Praise God. Pastor, come dismiss us. Let's give Brother Baxter another hand. Wasn't that wonderful? Hey, all you wonderful people will be back here at 10 a.m. in the morning. I'm so thankful you come tonight. Thank you for being here. Looking forward to seeing you in the morning. Try to get here. We'll have a great time here in the morning. In case some of you are looking at me, I'm the new guy in town. I've been here about seven months pastoring here at this church, and we're thankful to have all of you here with us at 10 a.m. Come with your spirit up high, and let's see if we can have a great time in the morning at 10. God bless all of you. Be friendly to everyone. God bless you.